We will now jump into our next panel, which is called Clearing the Pathway. With the reopening of China, this has injected much needed tourism flows into the value chain. This panel will be exploring what the barriers are to increase connectivity in Africa and the world what the lessons the global community can apply to other e regions to ensure travel continues to drive global economy. Please help me welcome to stage Larry Mador and his panelists. My name is Larry Mador, international correspondent at CNN. I'm so excited to lead this panel with Paul Griffith, CEO of Dubai Airports, Minister Patricia DeLeo, Minister of Tourism in South Africa, and Dr. Alfred Mutua, Minister of Tourism and Wildlife from Kenya. It's an amazing thing that we're meeting back here in person, obviously talking about clearing the pathways, reviving the travel and tourism industry after COVID. And at least in for Dubai airports, you're already back to 2019 levels. You're looking forward to projections for the rest of the year. And I think the value of being able to meet in person is that we're here. You get to see this beautiful, clean, safe African city in person. And I hope you get to go and see the mountain gorillas that we were talking about earlier. It's spectacular. I highly recommend it. You can't see Table Mountain on, 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 on video. You're going to have to go and see it. You have to see the wildebeest migration, the Mara in Kenya in person. There's no alternative for that. So using that as a springboard, Paul, starting with you, what do you think is the greatest either impediment or the one thing you think we need to further unlock connectivity and make sure we're clearing the pathway so people can move around the world? Well, thank you for that. I think, first of all, the, there is a massive challenge ahead, and I think we've referred to it many times during the course of this morning, and that is sustainability, because aviation, travel, and tourism clearly is a very tricky area. We saw in Julia's presentation this morning 40% of the carbon footprint of travel and tourism originates from mobility. Right. Uh, and to me, really, the call to action here is, is very significant, more significant than we're facing today. And the threat to continued success in the sector, I think, is very large. And that, that is because we are not taking this as seriously as we need to. But I can give you an example of how... What are we not taking seriously? You're, you're getting to it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm preempting here. <laughs> yeah. What we're not taking seriously is the fact that this needs to move up several gears. And we've done it before. I mean, let me give you a, an illustration. In the 1920s, if you traveled by air, it was an incredibly hazardous business. The chances of you completing your journey safely were probably far, far from what anything we would re require um, from safety standards today. And in fact, you know, in 2019, now, e even in recent past, since 1970, you are 81 uh, times more likely to complete your destination safely, to your journey to the destination. So safety has become part of the DNA of travel and mobility. Right. Now, the thing is, you see, I don't think that we can continue to suggest that sustainability can be dealt with in any other way. And safety has been tackled with three fundamental component parts. First of all, industry, the whole supply chain, has invested in the technology and the advancement to make flying safe. So the investment has been there. The second thing is industry has worked proactively with governments all the way around the world to evolve a common standard and approach. And thirdly, and most importantly, customers have come to expect that they can complete their journey safely. And the costs of all that have been embedded in the supply chain. So goods and services not just in travel and tourism, but across the whole of everything we use and consume, I think we need to change that attitude. We shouldn't be producing anything that doesn't fully have the mitigation and the cost of mitigation engineered into the supply chain. That means costs of goods and services is going to have to go up. But quite honestly, I'd rather pay the price of making sure that my children and grandchildren are able to continue to live safely and effectively on the planet right. by 
paying more for goods and services today. I don't want to be seen in the future as the person who could have done something about it and failed to do so. So the call to action is urgent and important and it needs a fundamental shift in the industry if we don't head for a big problem ahead. You don't think that the industry is paying enough attention to this because if you look at the literature of the organizations represented here, public or private sector, they all have sustainability goals and they have a date set to them, 2030, we, we have to be this and that. You don't think that's enough? Uh, there is a huge amount of publication and discussion. So the attention is there. Right. It's the mechanism to deliver, I think, needs to be ramped up. I don't think this item uh, is receiving the time scale of the urgency that it absolutely needs. And it's really governments and industry moving together and making sure we have a strategy for getting this done in the time scale it needs to be done. Thank you. That's a good point to yes. um, move this conversation further. Minister DeLeo was uh, nodding along. The topic of this discussion comes up in all of these forums all the time. So I'm going to ask you, what do you consider or what are the barriers to increased connectivity here in Africa and the rest of the world and how are you working to change that? Well, the low level of inter-Africa travel, air connectivity in the continent is depriving the continent of reaching its full potential. His Excellency uh, Paul Kagame made mention this morning of the single air transport market agreement. Right. Signed years ago. Niamosukro. Years ago. And today where we are sitting, only 34 countries of the 54 countries in Africa has actually signed that agreement. But the implementation has been minimal. So we, we either say we go forward doing two things. One, we leave the rest who did not sign behind. And the 34 countries of which South Africa is included that have signed that agreement, we move on. And then the second solution, I think, is that we need to get WTTC to intervene. I think WTTC will be able to be in a better position to convince those African countries that have not signed the agreement about the potential and the value for their respective countries. But we can't continue to talk about this forever and a day. So yes, um, for Africans to travel in the continent, you sometimes have to leave the continent to go and connect somewhere else and then travel back into the continent. Minister, I was just telling yes. Paul before, to come from Nairobi to Dakar, I had to fly to Dubai to yes. get to Senegal. Yes, I was recently in Mauritius with the UNWTO um, uh, Africa Region Conference, and many of the ministers that attended had to fly to Dubai and then fly back to Mauritius. So I also think we need urgency here. Together with the safety, but the urgency of getting Africa connected to the rest of the world, we are losing out. So action that we need to see from, from all African governments. And I've seen this morning as Excellency President from Rwanda and the President from Tanzania as giving us the lead that that is the way to go. We need to deal as African countries with the red tape. We need to deal with link to air access also in air connectivity. It's the issue of the visa regimes. Uh, we still have got too many problems around entry so that we can move freely in, in, in the continent. And I'm not saying South Africa is doing well, but we're trying. I want to say to Judy, uh, the issue of Ghana has been resolved. Uh, Ghana has got a 90-day visa wa waiver to come, and so does 34 other countries in Africa, visa waiver to come to South Africa. 
But I hope it, on forums like this that we will be able to not just talk about it, but leave away from here with a clear action plan. Thank you. You were talking about connectivity. Uh, Minister, I am flying from Nairobi on Monday to Casablanca. Yeah. I'm having to fly first to Frankfurt and then back to Casablanca. If you imagine that distance, that is a, the size of the problem we're talking about. Yes. My Minister of Tourism is here, and I know you're actively working to connect more of the continent. Kenya has made a recent big announcement about visas for Africans. Yes. Tell me about the thinking here and what this hopes to achieve. What you're looking at is, uh, thank you, Larry, we are learning from examples of Rwanda, for example, that have opened up visas, uh, ability for Africans to travel. The biggest challenge we've had as Africans is that for a long time, we've been uh, taught to fear each other. Yes. You find that at times it's easier for a European or an American to visit our continent than an African to visit a fellow African. It comes back to the days of colonialism, where mm -hmm. divided they fall, united they stand, and we are taught to divide, again, uh, you know, to divide you know, and keep away from each other. What you're looking at as Kenya is the opportunity, not only in uh, tourism, but also in development and also other factors. And the fact is this, with the African free uh, trade continental area and with the population and the economic growth projected for the continent of Africa, Africans trading with Africans is the way to go. So in Kenya, we are looking at, by the end of this year, to make an announcement that all Africans can come to Kenya uh, without requiring any visa. Uh, so they can come and stay and trade and, and visit because Africans are very good tourists, but they don't have that ability to connect. But we want to move it further to the rest of the world. As uh, most of you know, and as uh, President uh, William Ruto has repeated many times of Kenya, is that uh, the first, I think the, the, the finding by archaeologists are that the, f the first human being of the present homo sapiens, that is you and me, was found in Kenya, in a place called Turkana. So the question is, if it was found in Kenya, and that's where humanity began in terms of people getting up and walking and going to the rest of the world, why do the people of the world need a visa to come home? Because they're basically coming home. So we are looking at rolling out a free visa regime, not only for Africans, but for the rest of the world, so that people can actually come home. And in tourism, we are going to make it easier for you to come to Kenya. Up there where the remains were found, we're going to invite you to come and see where they are, but also give you a small brush and a chisel so you can go and dig a bit. You may find your ancestors somewhere there, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and, and make, it, make it an experience uh, for you. Uh, but it's all a mindset, you know. We mm. need to open up. We need to make it easier for people to come yes. and travel. But it's not just about visa regime. This is also making it the comfort level. You know, the travelers also want a sense of comfort level. I think yes. when you look at the travel to the UAE, for example, some parts of Europe, it's that ability for us Africans to bring the people arriving, welcome them well, and then provide the basics so that they can come and have a wonderful mm. time. And not only uh, to come and see animals, uh, or come and see us, or give them an opportunity of animals to see them, but also for entertainment. You know, Africa yes. is a home for music. Africa is a home for drama. So let them come and be entertained, and then go back after they also they have found their ancestors. <laughs> and go back after they have found their ancestors. <laughs> okay, so to make sure we understood you, so by the end of this year you're saying no African will need a visa to come to Kenya. That's a program we're working towards. It's a whole legal mechanism, but that's where we are targeting. By the beginning of next year, all Africans should be able to pack their bags and come to Kenya. And within a very short time, even maybe by then, we hope that we can open up Kenya to the rest of the world. So Let people come. No, every passport holder from every part of the world will not need a visa to come to Kenya eventually. You need to come and find out where you came from. You need to come and find your ancestors. <laughs> Why do you need a visa to come home? And that's the reality. <laughs> All right, uh, back to Dubai, Paul. Uh, you, we were saying at the beginning that your number of arrivals are already back to 2019 levels, and your projections is you're going to surpass that by the end of the year. What is Dubai doing differently that the rest of the industry should be paying attention to? What well, is the secret sauce here? Okay, well, I think it really started when the pandemic unfolded, and Dubai and the UAE government acted very quickly, first of all, to get the entire population vaccinated, 
I think we were the fastest country in the world to get the population vaccinated. Secondly, actually, we were the first to open up again after the pandemic in just four months. And obviously, there were huge um, health uh, uh, measures taken, and actually people that travelled were really looking for that reassurance. And we basically, we built a, a, a PCR testing lab on site so we could do quick turnarounds and allow people into the country with a, a negative PCR test. So we took all those measures proactively. And then behind the scenes, we did a few different things. The first thing was, instead of laying off thousands of people, we changed our business model. We actually retained the vast majority of our employees because we knew that when recovery came, mm -hmm. uh, it would be very rapid. Right. And the ability to skill up if we'd laid everyone off just wouldn't be there. So we were like a coiled spring. And when the recovery came, we didn't know when it was going to come. Mm -hmm. But when it came, it was incredibly rapid. And we were able to put a full capacity of the airport back in service in less than two weeks. So we were ready for the recovery. We had trained people ready to deal with a different demographic of customer who actually wanted more reassurance about health. And um, we were able to open up markets very quickly and reassure people that traveling through Dubai was safe. We had all the health measures in place. And the interesting thing, that approach not just worked for the aviation sector, it worked for the city as well. Right. And the number, uh, the percentage of people arriving on aeroplanes and not transferring before the pandemic was 40%, uh, was 60% going on elsewhere. Now it's reversed. 60% of the people on planes coming to Dubai are staying in Dubai and 40% are traveling onwards. So the visitor arrival numbers, which are obviously great for the economy, ha um, have been considerably greater than they right. were pre-COVID. And we're projecting at the end of the year, as you've already said, that we'll exceed our pre-pandemic numbers. And growth through to the mid-2030s, we, we think the airport will have about 120 million international passengers. How many passengers do you have right now? Uh, we're projecting 87 at the moment, but I haven't checked since this morning, so it may well have gone up. <laughs> 87 million. Uh, 87 million passengers. That's you have right, okay. yes. And, and also, I mean, I, I, I'm very interested in my two august colleagues on the right here talking about connectivity, because I didn't expect to be the bogeyman on this panel. Um, <laughs> connectivity, surely, for growth in travel and tourism yes, is yes. incredibly important. And uh, um, I, I could quote, actually, the former tourism minister, who is now the prime minister of Aus Australia, when he said um, uh, several years ago, look, the most important thing is that airlines and the travel industry work together to bring customers, travelers, visitors, people home to different countries. How they actually arrive there is perhaps less important because the economic and social benefit is there um, irrespective of which airline they come onto. Right. But I think helps around the corner because technology is changing. One of the big um, reasons why Dubai has been so successful as a hub is the economies of scale that large yes, aeroplanes yes, yes. and, you know, we've got something like... Um, 254 different cities, 104 countries, and 90 airlines. Again, I haven't checked those figures since this morning. It may have gone up. But um, the, the thing is, you see, the, the, the economies of scale, I, I think, can now be replicated with smaller markets. You've got aircraft coming on stream now that are far, far more economical to operate and can fly much longer distances. So smaller aircraft flying to more cities more economically, I think will be the answer to yeah, African true. connectivity. So having the agreements in place, having a good re visa regime which enables travel, yeah. and having the technical changes which will allow African airlines to invest in more economic hubs on the, on the scale that the particular markets will allow. I think will be more competition for Dubai, and yes. we won't be quite feel quite so reluctant to accept the travellers from Africa, which we're not at all reluctant about at the moment. I have to say. All right, and Minister, speaking about connectivity and the power of that, you were talking recently about the reintroduction of flights between South Africa 
and Brazil and tapping into that BRICS tourist market. And I think that's a huge part of your projections for recovery of the sector, um, wave, waiving visas eventually yes. for the Indians and Chinese to come into South Africa. What are you thinking about here? Well, we would, of course, like to strengthen our market um, with all the countries, especially our African uh, brothers and sisters. You know, out of the five million tourists we received last year, four million came from Africa. Wow. A classical example is Kenya. When we uh, got the visa waiver for, for 90 days for Kenya and the direct flight between Nairobi and Cape Town and Johannesburg, it's now our fastest growing market. So that just illustrates what can happen if the excess is there. Yes, the brick markets are important and we're doing well with connectivity between Brazil. Brazil has just launched another flight between Johannesburg and Cape Town. Mm. And also Air China came back in March of this year and that saw an increase of 243% of Chinese tourists coming to, to South Africa. Right. We are still working on getting a direct flight between India and South Africa, and that is on the cards. And then, of course, uh, Russia. But what I would love to see is that we get to improve air connectivity between and amongst the different cities within yes. the continent. Um, there are such a lot of opportunities where just connecting people there. So from South African side is that our own airline is coming back slowly but surely. Right. And we are currently, our market is open for, for competition for other airlines to also come in. And that's why I'm traveling to China next week. I said to the Chinese Minister of Tourism that 1.4 billion Chinese, Chinese people travel every year. I just want 1% of that mm. to come to <laughs> South Africa. So going there, we're going to deal with uh, the visa issue, uh, the issue of uh, traveling in groups. Right. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that you know, we'll be able to increase. But the BRICS market is also growing with the new members coming on next year. Ethiopia is there, Saudi Arabia is there. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia is bringing up a flight be, uh, to Johannesburg in December. We're talking to Saudi Arabia about a direct flight between Cape Town and Jeddah. So there are many opportunities. Right. We, we just have to, I think, organize ourselves in, in Africa, uh, a regional air access agencies with the private sector, with the skills in every region uh, to make sure that we coordinate and implement this long outstanding um, uh, single air travel agreement that was signed almost 20 years ago. This was okay. a fascinating example you just gave. Once Kenyans had their visas waived to South Africa, yes. and there's a direct flight between Nairobi and Cape Town, it's now your fastest growing market. That's right. So why does South Africa make it so hard for so many other Africans to come to South Africa when the obvious opportunity is there? Yeah, no, we, 34 countries within Africa uh, has got uh, the, the visa waiver, waiver like we call, call it. There's also the Africa Free Trade Agreement, yes. where we now not have to only just open our borders for trade, but also open our borders for, for people to travel. And that's being driven at another level. Um, to, to deal with the issue and complaints around visas is that the Minister of Home Affairs has now opened up a corporate office in his office. Uh, to deal with all complaints around visas. We close to an agreement with, with Lagos, uh, and uh, we close to an agreement with many of the other uh, um, African countries around the visa issue. But it's not that easy because it's not in my power. The mandate for visas is in another ministry. So it is working together. The Minister of Transport, Tourism, and Home Affairs all of us are working together now 
to ease traveling coming into South Africa. All right, um, Minister Mutua, do you have already recovery back to 2019 arrival levels or when do you project that will be and what is your big vision you recently just came into this ministry from the foreign affairs ministry you're a former journalist you're a former governor so you have varied experiences coming into this job kenya is recovering we we put together some measures that have really helped and uh, our push towards sustainable uh, industries our push towards climate change and others have really attracted many people to Kenya. Our president has been all over the world, uh, making Kenya an anchor nation. And as a result of that, the numbers are growing. We are looking at uh, the highest hotel occupancy uh, in the history of this country, of, of Kenya, at about 90% by the end wow. of this year, close maybe even to 100% by December. So we have totally recovered. But it's because we've taken measures, made it easier. The visa program mm -hmm. is helping because it is not only Kenyans going to South Africa, it's also South Africans also coming to Kenya. Right. Because now they are mixing with Kenyans and, and it's easy. Talking about the air transport, for example, uh, the connectivity and transportation, we really have to think hard about what to do because our small airlines may not be able to do the long distances. And there's been talk about collapsing some of our airlines that are struggling, South African Airlines, Kenya Airways, and others, into a regional airline uh, that can now be big enough to have to be able to, to ferry a lot of Africans within Africa at a cheaper place so that you don't have to go outside the continent to come no, back, back to, to Africa. So that's only. But also we need to think broadly. We are talking about climate change. We are talking about green energy. We are about connectivity. Look at Europe. Europe was opened up by trains. The Americans were opened up by trains. It doesn't have to be air. And we welcome private public partners to come, industry. Let's build uh, electric trains. And, uh, and you know, open up the continent so that you can travel from uh, Dar es Salaam all the way to Kenya, all the way to, to Rwanda where we are, through right. Uganda, cut across and end up at the coast of uh, Sierra Leone, you know, using the train system. So that as a tourist, you have more options than just flying because you can't really connect the continent with just uh, airports and airlines. So we need to think broadly in terms of what else can we do to grow the numbers. Mm. And there's a question for you from the audience here for the Kenyan minister. E-visas and electronic travel authorizations when done correctly are a good source of security and also revenue generation. So how will Kenya glo close both of these gaps if you go visa free? I think uh, one of the issues about, uh, I had a, I had a talk with a gentleman uh, earlier on, and we were talking about, oh, visas, you know, actually, you know, because you're afraid that you'll get terrorists, you'll get others. But, you know, the reality is that terrorists will always come, and they always find a way if they need to be there. They'll game the and system. They, they'll they find a way. They yes. don't usually come like other travelers. So we are keeping away 99.5% of people because of a 0 0.5 or 0 0.3 or 4 bad people. So we have to rethink the whole system of uh, fear of bringing people because of security, you know? And I think the UAE has been a very good example by welcoming the world to come, you know? And we, we just have to get our act together in other sectors and get people to come to the African continent. And look at it this way. What do we have to fear from our fellow Africans? What is the security threat from our fellow Africans? There is none, basically. You know, it's all in the mind. So if we open it up and people are able to come, and uh, even if we look at the cost element, it's a free visa regime, or even maybe you can pay for your visa right. on entry, you know, as mm. others from Europe and Americas are able to do. So you're not worried about the potential loss of revenue when people pay for e-visas or ETAs, they're just coming in for free? They can come, because we are looking at, you know, look at it this way. Don't look at... Uh, at the small uh, amount of money you're losing. Look at the larger pot that you're going to gain. You know, it's, it's, it's small compared to how much you'll gain right. by getting all these visitors coming in. Uh, the employment, you had Madam Slu talk about six million, you know, yes. the program, you, you gain much more by opening up to the world. You know, we always say that uh, if you want to, for those who are, uh, who are meat eaters, I know a lot of people are vegetarians, if you want to get a chicken, you, you drop 
droplets of maize towards you. You know, you drop right. maize, it comes, it's a Kenyan thing. Drop maize, it comes, comes, and then you're able to catch it, you know? And because if you run after it, you will keep on running. So you don't calculate the cost of the maize. <laughs> it's the chicken that you want, <laughs> not, not, not the piece of maize. Dropping. <laughs> I have a minute left to get final comments from Paul and Minister Delail. I know Dubai has a big expansion and upgrade process as you project all of that. So what's your big vision here, really quickly? Well, the vision really is to build on what my boss said to me 16 years ago when I walked into his office for the very first time. And I said, right, I'm here. What do you want me to do? And he said, just one thing, don't ever constrain the growth of the aviation infrastructure in Dubai. Mm. So I've got a very red or green objective to achieve and hopefully we can stay on the green side in both senses of the green word. Yeah. Just make it facilitate. Okay. Minister Delil, final word goes to you. What, is, what do you want this industry professionals to take away from here? Well, I would like to see that the partnership between the public and the private sector must be consolidated in the tourism industry. Government must facilitate regulations, visa, uh, um, access to our countries, but we can't do it alone as government. So mm. we need the help of the private sector. And therefore, I've called on WTTC to assist us to facilitate uh, regional air access teams with the tec technical skills uh, to bring us together as African countries and let us exploit that value. So partnership with the private sector for me is very key. All Thank right, you. that's where we're going to leave it. Please give a big round of applause to the panel. They've been fantastic. <laughs> Ministers, Vitua, Dulil, and Paul. Thanks a lot.